Morning. Cheers, wicked. Worked on it long enough. Don't know. Is your tour featuring a new release afterwards? Uh, I mean, probably, because hopefully we'll record some of them. We fucked up the last one. <laughs> Too stressed. Um, but yeah, we're going to try and get as many as we can. Hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, that was a coup getting that Barbican gig. Quite happy about that. It's going to be fun in there, I think. Sounds really good in there, so that's the main thing. Yeah, we got a Berlin offer, um, and then, yeah, I can't remember what happened with that. So yeah, it might, we might be doing Berlin at some point, but I think, ah, yeah, it was in the big concert hall. I can't remember what the issue was with it though. But yeah, we've got a vague plan of going there. We've got to book a lead show. Yeah, I know. And a Manchester and a Glasgow and fucking everywhere, right? I mean, I can't expect you all to go to London, really, but we're getting into it again slowly, I guess. It's the right way of putting it. I don't know. It's all a bit tentative at the moment. Because Covid's quite weird, isn't it? So. Yeah, it is. Well done. Fucking spotted. You can just tell from the house, can't you, basically? <laughs> yeah, I heard Phoenicia in a long time, you know. Fucking hell, since Brownout, I think, was the last thing I got. So, yeah, hit me up. Stick a link in the chat. You're allowed, I think, unless Twitch stops you doing it, I don't know. Current life set has evolved, if at all, since your first try at touring it before COVID. Um, well, we did, oh, it's a long fucking story. I mean, basically when COVID hit, um, I had a lot of time on my hands to rebuild a lot of it so it's yeah it's a lot of it you wouldn't even notice because a lot of it's just porting things to gen that didn't need to be ported but just because i wanted a bit more control um so, and that led me off on loads of tangents because once you start building basic things like oscillators you you go a bit mad with all the options so yeah um that happened and then i got heavily into MC and then that happened and then I built a lot more modeling stuff and I did that scratching thing that we used on that guest com thing that we done about just over a year ago and then did that and then and then yeah the set sort of grew out of all that tech basically so Stylistically, it's not that far off what we've been doing for the last few years because I think we're still in the same sort of place mentally. But tech-wise, the underlying, the kind of back-end stuff is is all fresh. So yeah, I don't know. I can answer in more detail if you ask more questions.
Chase for that link, by the way. Nod modular, no, not for me. I mean, I, especially since coming to Norway, but even before for probably about five, well, since 2013, really, I've had a really small setup. It's basically just computer, controllers, speakers, and interfaces. That's it. So, um, everything else I give to Rob or me other mates who were a bit light on kit and money. So, like, my electrons are with Mike Williamson and my Nord. Um, my Nord module is still in the studio, but I haven't been turned on in years. Um, Rob is running a lot of legacy computers to run a lot of this old hardware. And he's got a real... He's got a, he's got a big setup now, actually, because he's got most of the stuff that I used to have, plus the stuff he had. So what Rob's doing, he doesn't talk much about it, if I'm being honest. He just keeps it all on the DL. So it's all a bit... Um, he's a fucking enigma, Rob. I've no idea what he's using. You should ask him, basically. See if you can talk him into going on Twitch, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. He's not the type, really, but, you know. Yeah, no, there's definitely more layers. I mean, the just before we'd done the 2018 tour, which was only three dates, really. It was just like Melbourne, um, Tokyo and Dublin. So just before that, we doubled the number of channels that the rig could, could process. Because um, the CPU was getting there at that point and it just seemed sensible. But we weren't really getting the most out of it. Um... So we were just sticking in extra little bits of layers, trying not to fuck the music too much by just cramming too many bits in. Um, but with this set, it was written, with both of us are running 16 channels each now, so it's sort of... There's just more opportunity for, for having bits in there that are maybe textural or sort of... I don't want to say backgroundy, because they're still key, but... Um, yeah, it's just, just a bit more flexible basically um, and it means that I can do more staging of things so it, it can be more mutated which I'm quite into at the moment I'm into things that don't seem to have beginnings and endings that just bleed into each other for ages and having more layers makes that a bit easier uh, sick ringtones yeah you know what I've got some sick ringtones in my phone I should just share them um, Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. They're mine. So, you know. Any plans to release your live sets from the 90s, early 2000s? Yeah, um, so we've got a bit of a mixed bag of recordings from 2010. So some of them were ones that Jamie, our sound guy, had done um, with his little mic set up um, and then mixed with his soundboard recordings. And then some of them are his soundboard recordings. Um, and then we started just travelling with a Zoom or a little task cam that Rob's got um, and recording our own. So that's why it, uh, everything that's been released since has just been our own recordings. But we do have, and we've got a very, very spotty archive of prior sets. But most of them have leaked now. So they're, they were gigs where, because we were recording stuff early on, other people would do it, like the venue or the promoter would secretly record it. And then later on we'd get given a DAC. Um, and because we we didn't have the originals you know they've leaked eventually because somebody's been good enough to throw it at archive.com or whatever so there isn't an awful lot in the old archive that isn't out there already. I think the Sankey's set from 94 isn't up and that's quite a good one um, and there's probably a few others there's probably like five max but they're all sets that are up there. They're just different versions of those sets. So, you know. Uh, I've got to scroll back here a bit. Like, Oversteps and Confield shows would be amazing. Yeah, you know what? I don't know if there's any recordings other than that Lee's Palace one, which is pretty good, but it weren't the best set on that tour at all. Um, I think the best one was... It was in this tiny little black box venue. 
I can't fucking remember where it was now. Because I think it was it might have been Columbus, Ohio. That place was fucking amazing. The sound in there was mad. And it was like, yeah, I was able to get pretty forensic during the set. So that was my favourite gig on that tour. I remember it really vividly. Um, and the Princeton one was pretty good. And there's a, there's a sort of shit video of that kicking around. Um, but yeah, the... We haven't got recordings of any of them other than the stuff that's leaked already. Um, oh, thanks for all the props, by the way. Um, are you considering releasing any of the live sets from 2022 this year? Yeah, I mean, if we get time, but we like to put them out in batches, so... And it gives us an opportunity to kind of standardise the feel and the and the recordings a little bit, because obviously they're a lot, they're all a little bit varied because of the venue, and so levels have to be a bit different and stuff. Um, and there's a certain degree of post production. I mean, literally just like topping and tailing the things and making sure that there's no clipping and you know, little things like that. So there'll be tiny micro edits just to get rid of any kind of horrible glitches that might have happened. Um, so I like to do all that in one go. And then, so yeah, I don't know if it'd be this year, cause we might still be doing this set next year, depending on how it evolves and mutates. Cause obviously we're changing it all the time anyway. So, um, so yeah, I'm, it probably, basically but not i don't know if it'd be this year it might be next year probably next year the way things are going oh fuck i've lost the chat how do you get it back right um sankey set my goodness yeah <laughs> no way someone was there yeah yeah flutter we fucking we did a really kind of slow burnt out version of flutter in that sankey set and it's it's pretty good it's like quite different to the other ones it's like playing it at 33 except the sounds are slowed down you know yeah, that was fun. Um, but yeah, I've got a data of that somewhere in Manchester. So yeah, it's washable. You know, I'm not. I, I, no one's asked me where where we got that sample from, but I'm, I don't know if I'd tell you anyway. Um, yeah, cheers for all the props. Nice. I'm not naming gear anymore. I've give up. I've give up. I can't. I can't do it. But um. Yeah. All right. Your DX11 is called Harold Meeker. <laughs> Remixes. Um. Yeah. Fuck. I had a request recently off. Um, what's her name? Mike P's girlfriend. Um, Mimo, comma. But yeah, I was a bit busy with getting the set ready, so I didn't do it. But I don't know. Maybe I'll do that down the line if she's still up for it. And then I don't know. I got some other bits, like requests. Um, I had one from these Austrian electro guys. Fuck, I can't remember their name now. They're good though. They're fucking really good. They were on trust. Don't know if you check that trust label in Vienna. It's fucking high end shit. Um, but yeah, like there was, there's a few requests coming in. I'm always too fucking busy because there's just so much going on. But usually just me fighting around with patches, though. To be honest, so don't know if anyone else would care. Beyond Max, oh, this is... You know what, there's so many more interesting technologies that come along that you can plug into Max and use within Max that I don't bother checking other stuff out. I'm really slack and I've never been like that anyway. I'm not like one of these people who knows every synth, knows every bit of gear. I just tend to like buy one thing and then get really into that. Because I'm quite obsessive, actually. And you know, I don't know, I, I sort of, it's like with artists, I do the same thing with music, I like find an artist and just obsessively listen to one artist for a year, which is, I know it's not normal, but it is what it is, but um, 
yeah, so I tend to do that with gear. And Max is a bit of a bottomless pit. So I haven't got bored with it yet. But at some point, I probably will. And then I'll probably just dump it and just not use it at all for a bit. Because that's just the way I am with stuff. So, yeah, I don't really... I don't have favourite synths and stuff like that, really. I just tend to get stuff and then I'll, I'll find good stuff within anything really that you put in front of me but with Max there's just no end to it especially with Gen because you can always slightly incrementally improve the thing that you built two years ago so you might just rebuild things quite a lot I spend a lot of time doing that I'm quite into refining things at the moment getting them optimum and getting getting them as efficient as I can and you know yeah Um. How do you consider a release an EP? It's, yeah, so albums tend to have a kind of... Plus should have been an EP, and it should have had two, three tracks removed from it, but I was being greedy. But but that's what we should have done. Plus was basically should have been an EP. It felt like an EP when we were compiling it. Um normally that kind of thing would be an ep so we'd do the album and then we'd have a bunch of other tracks that didn't really fit on the album because the albums we don't design them to sound a certain way they just sort of they just grow you know like you sort of find yourself noticing as you're doing it that there's a thread and you follow the thread and then eventually you might towards the end of it you might do a couple of tracks to fit on the album because you've got an idea of what the thread is but you know at the beginning we're just doing scattershot stuff we're just trying out loads of different things and then the thread just kind of reveals itself so um eps don't really work like that as a rule we tend to just find the tracks that go on the EPs from what's left from when we did the album. So I won't say they're like off cuts, but they're stuff that just wasn't part of that thread. So they'll be like good tracks, but just not, they just don't fit the album vibe, you know? So, yeah. Um, what sound textures <clears throat> am I feeling? I can't answer questions like that. They're too weirdly vague. Um, yeah, it's a bit like asking me what my favourite colour is. I just don't... I don't fucking know. Like, ed anything that sounds good. I mean, it's too... There's too many things that I like. Too poly. Um, it's a new album in the pipeline. Yeah, new album's always in the pipeline, but I'll far down the pipeline it is I couldn't tell you at the moment it's mainly I've been working on this live stuff but it's again like albums tend to grow out of the same machines that are doing the live stuff now and there are various ports of the rig like I've got my version of the rig Rob's got his version which is a it's been mutated so much it's not really the same rig anymore and then there's a version that I ported to live uh, before we did sign and plus and all that it was very different because there's not as much recursion in it it's a kind of top down kind of control hierarchy and i'd say both of them are, are good systems but they're very different the way that the the rig works in in max when we're running it in max is that everything's real time so everything's informing everything else and there's a lot more cross communication so there is no hierarchy as such it's more of a web of interactions whereas the Ableton stuff is very hierarchical it's there's a kind of top layer of control information and then everything else responds to that um, and that's how sign was done and I'm I got a bit bored with it if I'm being honest it was like it, it was good but I prefer the the web to the the tree just more interesting um, for reasons so yeah so album wise i don't know it'll probably grow out of this stuff that we're doing and i've been recording loads <clears throat> some days i just record like an hour or two um a lot of days actually but it'll you know it'll be the same few patches 
working with each other over that hour and it'll be just me jamming with it for a bit and that might end up being like a five ten minute track so um just depending really how much good stuff there is in there um and on everything else like flow so yeah it's a bit a bit hard to say when an album will be ready i don't know when i can be bothered to put it together i'm more interested in doing the gigs at the moment just because it's been so long it's been like is it four years since we were doing gigs so <clears throat> i was pretty keen to get back out you know as you would be i guess um EP7 and Mover 10 are lengthy, but considered EPs, but <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So Mover 10, plus he's like Mover 10, basically, same sort of thing. He's like, no, it doesn't quite fit together as a release, but everything that's on there, we wanted to put out. So we just kind of bundled them up. It's like a kind of pick and mix, you know. Um, plan any mix on our tracks. Acts. Oh, right, yeah, the DJing. Yeah, I mean, I just fucking out... When lockdown happened, I just did that out of um, desperation, actually, more than anything. Just wanted to connect with loads of people because I knew what was coming. <clears throat> so, but after a bit, I felt like I'd... <clears throat> I'd kind of whittled it down to a, a small crew of nutters. And I was like, well, I'm just in this room with all these nutters now, so time to stop. Um... Obviously, I love you all, but, you know, nothing lasts forever. But, yeah, I'd probably do some more streaming in a bit. I've done a radio show, actually, for a little web radio project that a um, person called Lucy runs. Um, but I don't know what happened to that. I did that ages ago. Um, but I'm sure that'll surface at some point. But, yeah, beyond that, long mix LR things could do. I mean, I, I sort of feel like people know my record collection pretty well now. And, um, you know, I mean, a lot of it's old because that's what happens when you're old. You've got a lot of old music. You don't throw music away just because there's new music coming out. So, you know, it just tends to, even though I am buying stuff, obviously, I still keep up with stuff. But it's just, obviously, the majority of the music that I own is old. And when it comes to putting playlists together, I'm, I don't rule things out. So I'll just be picking from everything. In fact, the only time we've really done that is when we did that Deck Mantel thing, because they specifically asked me for an electro mix, and I thought, oh, I wouldn't normally do that. So I don't like, I don't like cutting my options down too much with DJing. But, um, but yeah, maybe in the future, a bit of Mixelar streaming. I mean, the, the last few streams that I did during lockdown were all just from iTunes, so they weren't... Um, they weren't prepared or anything. It was just, you know, it was just me fighting around with iTunes. So they weren't really mixes as such. I prefer doing mixes and spending a bit of time on getting everything right. And I mean, the live mixing is fun, but I'd like, I quite like doing bits of it prepared and then mixing them up live. So yeah, I don't know. It takes time basically. And I haven't had a lot of time to do that kind of thing lately. So, oh. Um, music Obsession, I haven't had any this year, you know. Been enjoying Patricia Taxon quite a lot. Um, I went through a Henry Cow thing a few years ago, and there's a lot of Henry Cow, you know. That's quite a lot of stuff to digest. So that was probably, like, for about three years. That was basically they were the only thing I was listening to. Sort of around the time we'd done NTS. Um... Lately, I quite like R. Benny, if that's how you say his name. I like his stuff a lot. It's really deep. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't like naming people, because I feel like I'm not naming the other people. Um, and I ain't got my iTunes in. I always forget names. But next time I come on here, if I do, I'll have um, a list of artists that I've bought lately that I've liked. Because I'm always like, rating stuff on iTunes, but it's just my library, so I don't share that with anyone, really. Maybe I should. I don't know. Think about that. Um, if you play video games, what are some of your favourites? Tempest? Centipede? I mean, I'm old, right? So... Um, do you reuse a lot of Mac sub-patches? How old is the oldest part in your patches you're using? 
Oh, that's a question. Um, yes, to the first part, because they're tools, ultimately. I build tools. Now, I didn't used to. I used to make like a one patch per track thing and the track would be the patch. But it's more challenging to build tools that you use more generally. It's a lot more difficult to do that. Um, and so I find that more interesting, personally. So yeah, I do. Um, how old is the oldest part? <clears throat> I'm vaping too much, sorry. Um, not dying. Um, so how old is the oldest part? Um, fuck, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. 20 years, 25 years. Probably still using bits from when we done EP7, because that was the first release where we properly used Max. Um, it's the first release where, in fact, I think it's the first release where we used Max at all. Yeah, it is. So, yeah, the, there's bits, because that original, I think the first track I did in Max was Lick Fly off EP7, so that was, and there are bits of the way that that works or the idea behind the way that the rhythm works in that, that I still use now. And it's just part of the vocabulary of our program rhythm in Max. So, <clears throat> but I don't know if, it, if you could strictly say that it's the same patch, it's not. It'll just be like part of the funk, the way that the patch works with metros and delays and stuff like that. So yeah, it, and things get revised so often you just it's like ship of theseus style stuff where you don't really know if you're dealing with the same thing anymore by the end of it but it's sort of got the same name and it's just got a new version number so the rig itself is like that now as well just the basic underlying architecture that means that we can play all the channels at once and everything has changed it so many times but um but it keep we just give it version numbers I mean, at the moment, I'm running like, I'm still on version four of the rig. The, the rig that I'm using is version four, but it's like, I think the last update that I made was a thousand and, no, it's 1100, 1102 or something. So that's how many versions of it that have been. It's just, yeah, it's quite a lot. So, but I keep them all because they're tiny, aren't they? So, um, Five sets are great for using my rowing machine. I used to have a rowing machine. It was in the garage when I was a kid. I think my dad had bought it and he didn't use it. It's one of them classic middle-aged, I'm gonna buy a rowing machine, you know. And it just sat there in the garage. And then eventually I, it let me put my decks in the garage. So I used to just sit in the garage, like doing mixtapes and then listening to them while I was going on the rowing machine. Fun days, right. Are there any soundboard recordings of the tri tour? Um, yeah, George Roby, but it wasn't the Tri Reptor, but it was the same set. So there's a George Roby. There was one from, I think, Cork, Ireland. Yeah, Cork. I think there's one from there somewhere. Um, and there's the Flex gig in Austria, which is, the, I think, the same set. I can't. You know what, I, I'm not, I ain't got a perfect memory, so, um, I think so, is the answer. Vividly remember you, Glasgow, set on that tour, it's done my favourite gig of all time, thank you. Live albums almost sound like albums in terms of flow. Thanks, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I think that the live stuff is probably where I put most of my attention these days. Um, I was... When we were doing the 2015 set originally, which was 2014, I was thinking, right, it's, this is, I'm gonna treat this like an album, really work it and not, it just be like a kind of hardware thing that, <clears throat> because I think before that, before we built the rig, we, we didn't really have, um, you know, we did the studio tracks, but it was clear to us that there was a, a big qualitative difference between that and what we could do live with patterns and loops and stuff. And I'd, I'd moved quite a way away from using loops just compositionally during the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. And it just wasn't really possible to do that kind of stuff live. So when we built the rig, we kind of, we were attempting to build something that we could use to make albums with. 
at first because it wasn't really possible to do the transitions because we couldn't figure out how to change 68 patches at once because that was a little bit too difficult for computers for hard drives basically at the time um and there were bottlenecks and it would jam up and stuff so when we did xi that was what we designed the rig for but we kind of we knew that if we could just nail all them transitional bits and, and make it work properly that we'd be able to use it to do effectively live albums like like that so um so yeah that first tour in 2014 which was just when we got it to work we just got it to do the transitions not totally neatly but neat enough to be able to do a gig um that was the first attempt at doing that and that was we were trying hard to make it work like an album you know but you know be flexible enough and rough enough and chaotic enough to to feel good and live and not stayed and kind of too worked and sort of have all the life sucked out of it which is how albums feel quite a lot of the time um not our albums obviously but you know a lot of albums you get that feel don't you like someone's worked on something too much and i don't like that i like i prefer the kind of immediacy that you get with live stuff so yeah it's about kind of having the amount of detail and and, and sort of depth that you would get in an album but have the immediacy and the kind of rawness of a live set you know that's kind of where that's the sweet spot for me that's what i really like and when we started out doing tracks most of the good ones were done real time they weren't we didn't have planned out arrangements we just kind of do a few versions of the track live where we were doing different pattern changes and then just kind of either select the best one or do as few edits as we could and um, that's kind of how I like working the, the most I, I never really liked DAW composition or you know I've got I got into trackers for a while but they're not really a great fit for me having lists of things it starts to feel too static and like there's a kind of there's an element of being perfectionist in there that I don't, I, it just doesn't work for me. I don't like that kind of thinking. It's kind of crypto fascist bullshit, I think. So, you know, anyway. Um, Hi there, excited to cross the channel. Do you, do you plan to someday extended mix alarm mixes you did early pandemic? It was so fucking epic. Yeah, I've been asked that already. I might do, depends on stuff. Which track should have been removed? from are you asking me about plus there i assume so um yeah the sort of the the more mellow synth ones i probably would have pulled off and just kept the beaty ones on there and then the mellowy synth ones i'd have just thrown out as little one-offs in different places so it's just about context and it's not like i wouldn't have released them it's just that as a as a compilation it was perhaps a little bit hasty to call it an album but you know you live and learn you ever felt tempted to start teaching techniques and you discover his Skillshare course? Oh fuck, I'm just be such a bad teacher. I'm so kind of, I'm such a kind of not, I'm not a very organized thinker in that sense. Um, it's what my dad always used to, my dad, you know, my dad used to drive rally cars when he was young. And then he was, he'd, he'd done like pursuit driving. He was a fucking good driver. But he'd never teach my mum how to drive because he he was afraid that she'd pick up his bad habits. And um, something like that with me, you know, I just, I'm a little bit like, well, can't you just figure it out for yourself? I kind of, the, the thing I like about Max is that it lets me try out lots and lots of different things and then figure out which ones work. And I think that's quite a productive way of working. It's not, a lot of people think that you have to have this kind of, you know, strong conceptual idea that you then realize and that makes you creative but i don't i don't think that being creative should be the goal actually i think that making good work should be the goal and quite often just doing a lot of random shit and then noticing that something's amazing can produce better work just that's what experience has shown so you know i'm not saying it would work like that for everyone but i don't do the kind of having having a way to do things and then doing the things it's just too boring for me so teaching people it's a little bit antithetical to what to what i like 
doing. I like having the freedom to just try out loads of different shit. And I think that's what Max is good for. And I feel like if people want to learn it, you know, they they should learn it on their own and do their own thing. I think it's really important that everyone has their own voice and does their own thing, you know, and not learn how to do it from some fucking so-called expert, which I'm definitely not. You know, there are people on the Max Forum with 10 times the knowledge that I've got. Um, I don't know whether they're making good work, though. So, you know. Um, but that's down to taste, right? That's a purely subjective thing, whether you think a piece of work is good. So, yeah, it's a can of worms, really. But I don't, you know, I, I didn't go to art college. I didn't. I didn't even really like music, like music tech engineering college. I didn't even really like that. You know, there was still too much of people saying, that's the right compressor. That's the right way to do that job. That's an expert drum micing technique. And I just used to think, oh, fuck off, man. Like, can't you just find your own way, you know? So, yeah, anyway, that. Find your own shit, do your own shit, do it your own way. It doesn't matter, there is no right and wrong. You know, make your own mistakes, learn from them. Mistakes are really valuable. They're like the number one valuable thing that you can that you can have is to make mistakes. So do that. I've been recently watching the HD version of the Plif and Visualize. Yeah, I like that. So okay, so like the Plif on video, I like it. It's very fucking derivative of Alex. Um that's why we didn't work with that guy, because I just felt like it was too close. And I'd rather work with Alex if I was going to do something like that again. Because I like Alex's sense of everything. He's just got a brilliant design sense. He's got very good taste, Alex. That's the thing that gets overlooked, I think. But I think the Plifan vid's good, and it's definitely not... It's definitely not shit or ugly or anything like that. It's just that it's a little bit too... It felt too familiar. It was like hearing somebody do... It's like listening to Wisp and thinking, well, yeah, it's good, but it's just like, it just sounds like somebody who really, really likes Aphex, you know? So it's not that it's bad, it's just, yeah, it's just, it is what it is, right? So, and I feel like it's someone else's voice. It's like singing in someone else's voice, which is something that I would never do. Um, use of reverb's always been inspiring. Uh, designing reverb in songs. Yeah, I mean, I sort of, a lot of my re oh, wow look at this bug oh it's flown off fucking yeah a lot of my reverb is like um tuned so because this was always the thing with 80s re i love 80s reverb but there's there's like you could always hear a good producer in the 80s because they would like not just arbitrarily shove the reverb on something it'd be somehow in tune with the other elements in the track you get it more in hip-hop than anywhere else you get it where somebody's laid the beat down and the reverb's in the mix already but then the, the mcs come in and the MC's got the, the reverb in his cans and somehow it's informing the pitch of what he's doing. He's sort of in tune with the whole tuning of the track. And I don't know how much of it people are aware of when they do this stuff, but I just think that they do it anyway. They just do it naturally, right? So they just find the tune. And it's a bit like if you write a beat on a 606 and then you go to write a 202 pattern over it, you're going to write something that's in tune with the snares and the, and the hats for it to sound good you don't just sort of arbitrarily because i've never done that i've never thought oh these are rhythm elements and their pitch is un unimportant and these are the this is the songwriting you know i can't think like that at all to me the whole thing is music so and i think good producers this is what makes good techno producers a lot of the time is that they've just they've just got a knack for picking up that natural tuning and it's the same way that you might pick up the natural the, the types of rhythms that work at different tempos, for example, you know what I mean? So, um, and you'll have the types of tunings that work with certain drum machines, if they're not drum machines you can tune. I mean, you can tune a 606, I guess, if you get the back off, but a lot of people don't. So, um, yeah, so, I think with reverb, the, the sort of 80s reverbs, a lot of the time, they had, they had a very definite tuning. They had a sound that some people had described as metallic and in, in, in harmonic, but you always got a sense that there was some sort of key coming off it, sort of an or a, you know, a different different notes. And so um 
I quite often use very simple reverb topology, but but like I have a, a hand in influencing the tuning of it. So depending on what the chords and the melody are doing, the reverb's tuning will be different and it'll change over time. That's the key thing, I think, if you want to get that Autech or reverb sound. But again, like I'm not telling you how to do it that way. That's just what I like. I just like those shitty reverbs from the 80s, the midi verb and the quadra verb, you know. The, the topologies are, are, are seriously fucking useful and very, very low on your CPU and give you that sound. And if it's that sound you're after, which in my case is just down to experience of having had those machines for years and just loving them because I've had them for years, you know what I mean? I've just grown to love them the way that you love your dog or something. So, you know, it's like that for me. And I'm not saying that they're the best type of reverb. So they're definitely not. You know, there there are some modern convolution reverbs that are just beautiful. Um, that thing Zynaptic did, um, whatever it's called, that's a that's a seriously gorgeous sounding thing. But it is what it is, right? It does what it does. So, um, and the you know quite often I'll use other techniques that aren't reverb at all. So I'll have like lots and lots of delay lines and all passes, but not set up in a normal reverb topology, and just explore different topologies because there's just so many ways you can connect all passes and delays and combs that you can make anything almost any of those combination of those things is going to be a bit reverb like but you might find that it might make more interesting tones or sounds than you would get from a reverb that's been designed to be an all-purpose reverb if you know what i mean so quite often the the, the smaller shit of topologies can sound more interesting um so and I th there are no rules with reverb when you start researching different types of reverb design over the years you realize that there there are no hard and fast rules everybody's just doing different shit and some of the more most effective topologies aren't necessarily the most complex you know getting complex results doesn't rely on building a complex machine this is a really important thing to know you know that um Sometimes the, the most simple machines can give the most complex results and the most pleasing results. You might not even be after complexity, you know. It's something I like, but not everyone does. But, yeah, just experiment, basically. But that's just general advice. I'd, I'd say always experiment. Uh, Sunvox, yeah, not, not anything commercial. I had it on my phone for a while. I love it. I think it's a beautifully built piece of software. Um it's a lot of fun to use, but I'm just not into trackers enough to get the most out of it. But I would absolutely recommend it to anybody who is, because I think as a tool set, it's, it's phenomenally powerful. And I think, and I mean, you know, I, I have huge respect for the, the thought process underlying it, but in, both in terms of the interface and its functionality. I just think it's a great, great piece of software. It's probably one of the best trackers out there. And it seems to be totally unused. Because I don't hear it tracks and think, wow, Sunbox, there it is, you know. So um, everyone goes for Renoise. I love Renoise. I think it's beautiful. It's, but you know, it's big now. It's it's like iTunes, you know. It's big. Um, Sunbox still feels slick, and um, I don't know, apples and oranges. What I, I don't know why I'm saying that really, to be honest. Do you feel the urge to release music anonymously outside of the well-known money? Because we can't contractually at the moment because. Our warp deal literally says that we can only release music under the name Guestcom if we don't do it as Autechre. And we only choose to release stuff under the name Guestcom if our mates are involved or if it's a project where it's for our mates. So, yeah. Um, answer is, short answer is we can at the moment. Do I feel the urge? Yeah, I mean, all the time. You know, just set up some random band camp and shove some stuff out and not have the pressure and not have the expectations yeah um that seems fun or produce some rack up records for people that are like you know not the type of thing that people would expect from us and not have to deal with the fallout of the criticism for having tried something new yeah you know those are tempting things um but they're not so tempting that they're gonna make me go and do them immediately I don't know if our warp deal ran out. I'm not sure that I would immediately start producing hip hop records or anything, but maybe. Got bees here, you'll have to excuse me. 
So, do you think I'll always be making and releasing music? As long as I can, you know. I mean, if I, if I went deaf or something, I'd have to stop, wouldn't I? So, although I'd probably still f try and figure out a way of doing it. Like, if it was me here that went, I'd probably use bone conduction or something, cause, because that works. Did you know you can hear up to 60 kilohertz with bone conduction? It's crazy, right? Um, but that's what I heard. So, how do you not burn out by putting out so much stuff? That, what keeps you in the loop of creating? Um, I don't, I mean, I see this, I see people talk about this burnout and, you know, when plays work, it, does, it doesn't work like that. You don't burn out when, when you, I don't have, I mean, I say to people I'm working, if they're like, oh, are you coming out? I'll be like, no, I'm working. But I don't really mean working. What I mean is, no, I'm playing with me toys. So it, I don't think you can burn out doing something like that. I don't think it's possible. Um, and I like routine because, you know, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. So it, I like routine. I like things to be in their places. I like to do the same thing every day. Those things appeal to me, so I, I don't think, I think burning out, I mean, I, you know, I'm more likely to have a meltdown if, if everything suddenly becomes very unpredictable and weird. You know, COVID didn't put that much pressure on me because it was the life I was living anyway. So it was just like, oh, well, now everybody's doing what I'm doing, except that they all are complaining about it, but okay. Um, don't seem to communicate much on stage do you rehearse a lot or is it it's an intuitive thing we don't rehearse at all but the rig we do share so you know we i've got uh bits of rob stuff he's got a fully up-to-date version of what i'm doing all the time so he gets nightly almost builds um yeah so that happens um I think he can run my rig in his house, so he knows exactly what it'll do, but he doesn't know quite how I'm going to play it on the night. And so I'll be doing surprising things with it, and he'll be reacting to them with his controllers. So it's a kind of, yeah, it's very much an intuitive thing. We both know what the parameters are that are available to us, but we don't quite know where the other person's going to flex it, and we'll react to each other. And he does occasionally say things like, that's top, and so I'll just stay there for a bit, you know, um, and work it, and I'll... But, you know, I'll have already thought it myself, usually. I've thought, wow, that's top, so, you know. Because I'll just find some weird little pattern or something and be like, ooh, you know. But when I, hear it, I hear him doing it all the way through the set as well, so it is purely intuitive, yeah. I think you don't... We don't... We, we didn't really talk about stuff a lot anyway. In the old days, we would just know when things sounded good. Um... I mean, you just turn, you know when you, you hear a good bit in a track when you're out with your mates, you sort of turn to one of your mates and you go, ooh. You know, you don't say, ooh, and then a sentence about why it's good, do you? Do you know what I mean? So, <clears throat> you just know, right? You just know when things are good. <clears throat> Pandemic drones. Will they be available somehow? <clears throat> the Pandemic drones? What's that? Give me more information. I don't understand. Uh, have you heard the newest... Axos Rosman on Ideological Organ. No, I haven't. Maybe I should check it. I've literally only been listening to Arteca for about a year, so ask me any questions about other artists, I won't know the answers. Um, just doing my own thing, living in my own funny little world. Um, I always thought you'd be more into FUBAR than iTunes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, um, you know. I quite like iTunes. It's quite it's good for it used to be good for organizing a lot more than music. So I used to have all my video playlists and shit in there. Video playlists, right? I mean, fucking hell. I mean, don't burn out by not doing something that you that you if you don't want to burn out, don't do stuff that you don't enjoy doing. You know what I mean? If you're like a hardware person and you hate the DAW timeline bullshit, don't do it. It's that simple. If you just do what you want to do, if you get bored doing one thing, using one piece of technology in one way, use it a different way or use a different technology. Sell it, buy something new, change it up. Don't get bored, but basically, that's the key to not getting burnt out if, for me. But this, you know, I can't give general advice. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not normal enough. Um, 
Lick Fly is an amazing track, thank you. The Max Tools thing, you have a way of standardising inputs, outputs, so that you can plug everything into everything else. So, oh, it's complicated. Um, yes and no, basically. Yes, because it's Max, and so there are three module types. There are um, So there are sequencer modules, and they are output control data only. And then there are synth modules, and they input they receive control data and output audio data and then there are effects modules which technically do all all of the above right so the synth output control data as well i should have said so the control data goes all the way down the hierarchy um the um audio data starts at the synth and then carries on through right so but so technically an effect unit can be a synth and a sequencer as well um and they are a lot of the time too and and yeah, the other key difference between our system and other systems is that we don't use keyboards, so there's no note on, note off thing. The notes are sent by duration, which means that the synths and the effects units know the duration of the event that's about to happen, so they know what to do within, within that time. Because coming from a tape background, I didn't, um, I never liked how with DAWs you add your envelope on your synth and then it would always just be the same shape right so because it had to be because it was sort of the attack portion at least and the decay portion would always be the same sort of length of time i mean you can vary it with using velocity and stuff like that but it's just really imprecise and i never really like that so um and with tape you always know how much time you've got to fill ahead of doing the edit right so you you know you've got an eighth note to fill you've you know what you can fit in that or you know you've got three eighth notes or whatever it is so um or not notes just seconds milliseconds whatever so you sort of think differently when you compose with tape and i grew up doing that that's that was the first stuff i did so um so i build my synths in that way where they know ahead of schedule how long the note is going to be so they they can make something more appropriate for that length of time if that makes sense um, so everything has to be able to talk to everything else. And that means the effects units also have to be aware of things like note duration and pitch and also the other available pitches, the other pitches that the other instruments are playing. So all the sequences know what the other sequences are doing at all times. So, yeah, I mean, it's standardised it's, but it, and it's very flexible. I mean, in, insofar as, like, the effects units the most flexible because they receive audio and control data and they output audio and they and control data to each other so they can effectively they can do everything so you could just build your whole track inside an effects unit if you wanted so it's as flexible as max ever has been really but um it's just that by having these kind of layers of control it means that i can be a bit more um I can think a bit m more like somebody using hardware so i have that's why i have discrete sequences because i sort of it's just conceptually a, a little bit easier to work with for me coming from a midi background and a hardware background to have you know synths effects units and and sequences because they're the elements that i'm familiar with but obviously in max it's nothing nothing is what it seems so yeah if that, oh, that makes sense um do you listen to other war parties from time to time, not just Apex Square Pusher, etc.? What's the etc.? I don't know. Um, I really like Tom's thing that he did for NTS, that live acid sort of drum machine that was fucking so good. Um, yeah, I don't know, like, um, no, probably, but I don't listen to much stuff in that sort of area anyway. I don't really listen to Apex and Square Pusher that much, to be honest. So probably should do, because they're my mates and contemporaries, but I just, it's just not on my radar, really, musically. Richard used to be, um, but I kind of drifted away from that whole mindset quite a while ago, sort of the late 90s. Um, so that rig have a graphical UI? Yeah, I mean, because it's Max, right? So it's but it's pretty minimal. I mean, it's mostly like the slots, the slot names. Um, I don't know. I'll have to show you, and I can't do that right now because my phone, you know. But um, it's pretty bare bones. I don't really use a lot of D 
display of, of data. I just have like a little, I have a spectroscope and a little oscilloscope and an XY phase scope. They're the only consistent interface elements. All the, all the sequences and effects units and stuff, they're like mostly just lists of variables and, and sort of the occasional function. So, and yeah, that's kind of it. Um, they're pretty bare. I don't really like having a lot of visual stuff going on. It just makes the patches not work. So, um, how do you feel about people cheering, ruining the intervals of silence during the last move? Yeah, well, it's just Pavlovian as fuck. It's just like big chord weight, big chord, you know. So it's a bit like, you st <laughs> it's just sort of funny but weird. Yeah, um, you know, it's a bit embarrassing. It's a bit cringy, isn't it? But you know, um, I. Feel you I keep forgetting so much stuff. Any interesting stories from being on tour? Um, right, I need a piss, so I'm gonna end this and come back in a minute. Bye.